Welcome to the Burley Ads. My name is Mark Machado. I'm joined by the Professor of Cricketology, my cousin in the US, Dominic Machado. We are going to review uh, New Zealand's Test Series loss to the mighty Sri Lanka. Um, 2-0 uh, Sri Lanka won. Both matches played at Gaul. We're going to get through what it all means with our top takeaways. We're going to talk a bit about areas that we think Sri Lanka need to work on as well. Before we get to that, though, I'm going to remind you You've got a, a, a few things first. So I'm always so excited and tripping over my words. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that follow button. Leave us a like. Leave us your comments. We love hearing from you guys. We love hearing what you've got to tell us, what you what your takeaways are from this game, what are your top things that Shrunk did well this series, what are the things you think Shrunk need to work on as they start to think about the South Africa series and then Australia coming early next year. I want to know what you guys think as well. This is a community. It's not just us. It's about at its full and about Sri Lanka fans all over the world. So get involved. With that in mind, you can also sign up to our newsletter, Murali End, um, at uh, Substack. What's it? What is our newsletter? Is it Murali Substack. Yeah. That's, that's the address, the, the links in the bio, in the description. And you can join our WhatsApp group as well. That's our channel. We put updates on all the time. The Women's World Cup is hours away. From starting, Sri Lanka going in there. We're all very optimistic about our hopes. Estelle is in the UAE as we speak. She is there. She is in Dubai. Um, I don't know what she's doing right now. I assume it's quite late there. She's probably having a biryani and thinking about that warm-up game and why Scott just made... They just wrapped up a few minutes ago. She's probably still at the stadium. Still she's at still the at the stadium, yeah. Maybe she's not having biryani then. She's probably in and about the squad, finding out how they feel and what they're thinking before that first game against Pakistan on Thursday. Um, so if you want to stay on top of everything that's going on with Sri Lanka at the Women's World Cup, join that WhatsApp group. We put updates in. It's not a group. Sorry, it's, it's a, I think it's called the channel. We put updates in all the time. You can't see our numbers. We can't see your numbers. You can leave us emojis when we post, though. If you don't like something, Think his dad is okay. That's fine. He can show negative emotion. Stop being so Sri Lankan about it. It's okay. Um, and uh, if you like what we're doing, leave us a thumbs up. And on top of all that, remember, if you need a mortgage, Mike Ward Mortgage Services is there for you. Um, they can provide you mortgages in the UK, in the UAE. So if a star wants to stay in the USA, she <laughs> likes it so much, she wants to buy the place, uh, she can get in touch with Mike Ward. Maybe the girls might like it so much if, if mm. they... Go to winning rug, they might never want to leave. They can get in touch with Mike Ward and get themselves a house in Dubai if they so need to. If you want to buy a house in Saudi Arabia, Mike Ward could help with that as well. What have my life come to? Plugging mortgages in Saudi Arabia on a, on a show about Sunken <laughs> Cricket. Anyway, Dom, let's get into it. 2 0. It's in the end, end up being quite an emphatic victory. Mm-hmm. What I want to do before we get into your highlights is I want to ask you. How you felt when New Zealand got skittled out for eighty eight in that in their in their first innings? Oh my gosh that that was a it was one of those stunning things where um, I was traveling, so I was between time zones. So one of the big benefits is I got to see more of the more of the match live than rather watch it on on replay. And so I got back to my hotel room and play had started maybe thirty minutes before. And I flip it on and all of a sudden it says 55 for seven. I'm like, what is going on? And, you know, I I got caught up on the action and then watched live from there. I couldn't believe it. Um, It's been so long since we've seen a match where, especially a test match, where Sri Lanka, um, you know, sort of put their foot down against a really good opponent and said, okay, we've scored 600 first run, runs in our first dig, and now we're going to put you away. We're going to end this game and put it dead to rights. Um, you know, and, and New Zealand, we know their quality. We know that they always show up. They always play hard. Uh, we've struggled against a number of those players, Tom Latham, Cam Williamson, Daryl Mitchell, Glenn Phillips. So I, I'm always concerned that something's going to happen. Um, but the way that they bowled, the energy that was in the field, it was absolutely brilliant to watch. Um, and I was telling my son about it the next morning and he said, they got all out for 88. I was like, yep, it, it was, it was one of those amazing um, moments. And it felt like uh, this team had kind of come of age, right? We've been seeing them work and put um, a lot of effort in over the last 
couple months. And that, that sort of um, second and third day, it kind of all came together. And we saw this is what this team is capable of. By the ball in full flow with the bat mm. and with the ball. Um, we will, I, I asked, I put a question out on, on our, across the social media channels earlier when I asked for your questions uh, for us to answer during the course of this. And we'll do that like we did for the England series, we'll do it as a separate pod. So we'll do our bit first and then uh, we'll answer your, your questions, which we'll release about 12 hours or so after we release um, this episode. So, Please do stick with us. But if you're looking for your question to be answered, if you're doing what I do, fast forwarding or rewind and look, wait for your question, that'd be the next episode. Sorry to disappoint. Um, Dom, let's get into it though. Your your top, what was your top takeaway from Sri Lanka's performance, not just over the, the second test, but over the whole series? What was your number one takeaway from it? My number one takeaway, and I'm debating between two. I know you'll cover the one that I don't cover if I don't, but my top takeaway is this is the best test side that we've had for at least a decade. And I think we can be a little bit more aggressive and potentially put, put it back to 12 or 13 years. Um, in terms of completeness of a batting unit, we've got young talent in Potham and Kamindu. We've got seasoned veterans in Chandi and Angelo and Demuth. We've got Kusal Mendes coming in at that number seven spot and, and adding a little bit of flair. And we've got bowlers, too, for different conditions, not just, OK, we're unbeatable at home because we've got a Heroth or a Murali, but we've got Prabath and, and Nishan Pires, and we'll talk about him more later, I'm sure. And then we have a pace attack that we just saw perform in England, right? And, and players who can play their roles, and it all adds up. We've had great players. We've had the likes of Murali. We've had the likes of Sangha. We've had the likes of Mahela. But as a team, one through 11, I think the talent level on the squad is uh, pretty fantastic. We've we've developed a deep pool of talent that we're drawing from to create the squad. And for me, uh, it's not just that we're third in the World Test Championship or that we're ranked sixth, but looking up and down the squad, thinking about what they can and cannot do, um, this is a very, very complete test team. And I don't think we've been able to say that for quite some time. Um, and I think this is a team that Sri Lanka will talk about, hopefully, if they continue their run um, in the future as one of their great test sides. Um, I think it's a really interesting point you make. And I kind of agree largely with what you said. I think there's two two kind of bits that need, I think need to be added to it. It's firstly that Actually, when you look at it, Sri Lanka's been a great white ball nation, but not necessarily a great red mm. ball nation, right? We've obviously had our moments where we've been great at red ball cricket, but actually we've way, you know, we've produced way more mm-hmm. white ball legends than we have red ball legends, mm-hmm. right? And actually when you when you start to crunch the data on some of it, look at the numbers and the averages, I mean statistically, this is by far and away one of the great the, the greatest test side Sri Lanka have ever had, right? Because we've never had so many batters. Uh, whose average is, like, to, to be honest, kind of world class, right? And we can get into a debate about whether they're stab padding or the era of cricket that they're playing in or, or whatever you, you want to talk about it, right? But if you're building a Hall of Fame, there's a lot of players who are currently in this side who are going to be in that Sri Lankan Cricket Hall of Fame, mm. right? Um, may, maybe not immediately because, you know, Sri Lankan cricket social media and Sri Lankan press works slightly differently to everywhere else in the world. So maybe you need a little time to reflect on, on their talents. But I, I think it's it's kind of fair to say. I mean, there's a, you know, I'm going to say something that's going to be controversial, but An- Angelo is undoubtedly one of our best ever players, right, um, in terms of talent. And I think the frustration a lot of fans have with him is that he didn't go on to be one of the world's greatest ever mm-hmm. players or have a period mm-hmm. of dominance. You know, when people talk about the Fab Four or, you know, the people mm-hmm. talk about, you know, there are people who think he should have been part of it. People, I've, I've seen people kind of try and compare it to Ben Stokes and say, you know, he should have been that type of player. Actually, you know, the, the main kind of asterisk on, on, on Angelo's career has been injuries, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but... You know, he he's he's done it with the bat for a very, very long time in Test cricket now, right? 
Mm. When you when you look at the the fact he still maintains an average over forty five, that's quite incredible. I mean, Dimuth is is pretty um, it's pretty good as well. Um, with like with his with his figures, his numbers, I'm not sure he's going to get to ten thousand runs. That feels quite mm. far away at the moment, just because of the we're not playing a huge amount, you know, as much Test cricket as some of the other sides are. And um, also, I do think at this stage of his career, he's maybe stuttering slightly to get the the real top, top, big, big scores. But I think the the most exciting thing about a batter lineup is our two youngsters, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and for the first time in a very, very long time, I think there feels like there's players coming through behind behind this eleven as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Madushka has obviously been dropped. Um, recently, Sadir has been in around the team. Rashada Fernando mm-hmm. was in the side, scoring runs, got dropped, kind of rebuilt, is, is back in the squad. As I correctly predicted, he didn't play <laughs> part of this series. Um, but, you know, we, we know there's, and there's other talent beyond that as mm-hmm. well. So it kind of feels like actually, in terms of Red Bull cricket, I think Sri Lanka is as healthy as almost anywhere else in the world is, beyond maybe. Like beyond India, right? Mm-hmm. Um, England, like Australia, Australia, probably. Australia, I would probably put in that list as well. But yeah, yeah, but but it's interesting, right? Because when you listen to kind of Australian equivalents of Murali End, I don't know what they might be called, Lion Corner or something. Um, then they all talk about, you know, where's their next test batters coming mm-hmm. from? Where are the guys are going to play kind of longer formats of the game coming from? Yeah, I, I think Mark, you're you're 100 right. The health of the Test side is has hasn't been this good for a long time. The A side is coming off a big victory in South Africa against South Africa. Um, great fast bowling prospects, Isitha, uh, which is Sundara. They've got a bunch of batters knocking on the door: Lahiru Udara, um, Pasindu Surya Bandara, um, Pavan Ratnayaka. Lots and lots of guys. So we don't have to look into this next era with fear, kind of like we did when um, Mahela and Sangha retired, but one of kind of excitement and thinking about, okay, what are these new guys going to bring into the squad? And I think the excellence of Patham and, and Kamindu has been part of that optimism. The other thing I'll add is just, again, to point out how rare to have this many players of this ilk is in this team. So when Chris Almenda scored his 10th, um, century, they became one of three international test sides to have five, ten, um, t- five guys who have scored 10 plus centuries um, in a lineup. So I think it was 2004 Australia, um, 2008-9 India, and um, 2010-11 South Africa. And uh, those are some very, very good test sides. Now, I'm not going to claim that these batting lineups compare um, because those guys didn't just get 10 centuries. A bunch of them got 20, 30, um, and in some cases, 40. But um, it is it, it speaks to the quality of that lineup um, that they could that they produce that. And uh, I think I think it's it speaks to one uh, good times coming up in the future, in the immediate future. But also, I think. There is a lot of um, potential in the squad to be really good for a long time. Um, can I give you my t- top takeaway from, from this yeah. series? I think this series has proved out that the leadership around this team aren't afraid to make really big calls and big decisions. I think drop in Ramesh Mendes, and we could, we could go into... Uh, we can have a chat about how they treated him over the course of the series because I think that's a different conversation that needs to be had. Mm. And obviously, me and you being based not anywhere near the side, we'll probably have a slightly different take to what the team would have. But the fact they did it, I think, to, to break up a winning side, that's what all the best teams in the world do all the time, right? Uh, they make big, bold decisions. We know Sri Lanka cricket, I've banged on about this, a lot over the last few months is at its best when it's most innovative, making bold decisions, right? Um, 
I think to drop someone into a winning side is all, all, almost always the right thing to do, opposed to you know when the chips are down and looking looking around and hoping a rookie or someone on debut could could kind of pull pull a rub out of the hat. I think you know it, it exudes confidence to me, and also I think it shows intent about what this team wants to achieve. Right? I as as a Journalist, as somebody you know talks about stroke and cricket, when you're around the side, which I was during the England series, I, I'm kind of naturally looking for a story. So I'm kind of going, "When do you think Angelo is going to retire? Angelo, when do you want to retire? Like how many? How long? How long's Dimith got? What like? What's he got? But actually, mm-hmm. I don't think the team is thinking like that at all. I don't think the squad's thinking like that. They're thinking, what can we have achieved as a unit? There is a carrot. There is a light at the end of the tunnel that, you know, there's still a very long tunnel, but I think there is a, there is a light at it that they can they at the mm-hmm. at the bottom of it that they can see and that they're definitely aiming for because they talk about it a lot. That's this game in London, which I don't really want to mention, but I think the fact they're showing intent and they're building towards it is absolutely incredible. And also, it's it's it sh- it shows that what what like. The, the the kind of they feel they're feeling everything we're feeling as fans, right? They want to not just mm. win games by small margin; they want to go and absolutely miller teams, which is what they ended up doing in the second test, right? Yeah, this is this is an interesting point here, um, and and so noted. I one thing I noticed in the way you framed this, Mark, is you said Sri Lanka cricket is making big bold decisions. You didn't give us an agent here who's pulling the strings behind it. And I think um, at least Sri Lankan media has given a lot of credit to the team's resurgence to a certain Sanath Jayasuriya, right? And making these big, bold decisions. Um, I'm curious the role of DDS in this as captain. I think that's something that's worth kind of um, thinking about a little bit. Again, we're not proximate to the team so we can't tell you who's who's calling the shots here um so i think there's some good and some bad i think with someone like ramesh mendes he's had a long time and pulling you know sort of pulling him out of the side was the right move to make there even though it, it is a difficult move and nishan Pierce came in and showed what he could do and showed his his skill um on the other hand there was the the switching of Milan Ratnayaka for Lahiru Kamara, and that was a decision that I don't know how I feel about it. Um, clearly, they wanted to bolster batting. That was the reason why Milan Ratnayaka was brought in. But in the end, he basically did nothing <laughs> during this test. He didn't have to bowl. Um, he did bowl like two overs, but he didn't have to bat. But he didn't do very much of anything. So... Oh, I do think it was. It is a bold decision, and I think the best teams try to take those decisions and think what is best for this particular circumstance. But at the same time, um, one thing that does worry me is, and this is a longer term worry, not a short term worry. I think with certain formats, chopping and changing players um, is not good. So for like shorter formats, you think of someone like Patham Nasanka, how much he has improved because we stuck with him even when people were saying, oh, he has a 110 strike rate. That's not good enough for T20 cricket. Or he can't open in in ODI cricket. So we have to find that. I I don't want to see our younger players, especially in some of these um, formats where fortunes vary a lot, right? Like you you might get hammered in one one match and then come back and deliver a match-winning spell in the the next match, right? So I'm a little worried that the desire to tinker might – be overdone because you've made a few good choices. Um, another big decision that I think they made correctly was. Um, uh, hold on, hold on. Before, to, oh, but, yeah. I was gonna, I was just going to pick you up on some of the points that you made there. Yeah. Um, I think Kamara was probably rested because he needed rest. I think they probably thought mm. was it three tests or four tests? Three tests he played on the bands was probably yeah. a bit a bit too much for him. I oh, know to risk him for it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. they they need to to avoid him getting injured, um, and when I, the reason I said SLC Sri Lanka cricket is because I think that there's it's twofold. I actually think there is a decision making group at the top. Mm-hmm. Um, I think 
you know, at some point we need, yeah. we're going to have to talk about Southern Dresser as a coach and what, what he actually brings. I've seen people have started tweeting out what his kind of coaching philosophy is and it appears to be yeah. kind of trying to equip, equip the seniors and empower them to to make the right decisions under pressure and make the, mm-hmm. the youngsters feel comfortable enough to play, play their most natural game, um, which actually, you know, you, certain sounds good that that I'm not I'm, I'm not knocking it in any way but the thing that struck me from watching a lot of DDS press conferences is he's not difficult of, of answering tough questions I mm, think no I said this a lot during the England series so I was like I think DDS is framed wrong slightly in in yeah. in the media because I think a lot of people think he's just like this smiley cuddly shrunken bloke when actually mm. that guy is making the big bold decisions that get us over the line. They're not always going in his his way, right? Mm. Um, look at you know when he wins the toss. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, at like you know, like it went badly at Lords, and it's kind of worked all right for him ever ever since then, right? Um, and he was kind of it felt to me like he was owning that Ramesh made this decision to mm-hmm. to drop it so mm-hmm. i don't yeah. think you're, you're able to to make these decisions whoever's coming up mm-hmm. with the ideas and they're not happening unless dds has signed off for it i've seen Salah mm-hmm. speak in the press conferences big decisions aren't happening unless he's happy with it so whatever that kind of leadership group is at the top it's working and i don't necessarily think it's I don't think it's a dictatorship at the top there. I think they've they've stepped away from that approach and actually yeah. gone for a more kind of I want to say all hands leftist approach, uh, which which seems to be a trend in Sri Lanka at the moment. Um, I'm not knocking it because look, Sri Lanka's winning, um, and and I have no political opinions. Um, so so I think it's it's that's the reason why why I framed it that way because I I, I do think they're you do see the senior players come out and speak. It's interesting when you when during a test match when they have to do a press conference at the end of every day. It's interesting just seeing who speaks. If it's DDS or Sadath or Chandi or Angie or, or yeah. um, Dimuth, then those are the senior guys who are coming out to tell you what what the kind of dressing room thinks mm-hmm. and what and they're trying to put out the kind of a. It's, it's been a good day for Sri Lanka. If it's not those players, if it's Kim Javid, or I'm not even sure if he's with the squad at the moment, or um, who, whoever, you know, somebody else, Ian Bell, then maybe they might have just sent out the person who's not the best that singular to come out and answer questions um, about a dressing room <laughs> that largely speaks not in English. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, it, yeah, it's, it's Sri Lankan cricket, it's, it's I th- it, the last kind of what six weeks, seven weeks, I've looked two months. We're, we've seen it kind of go from being a caterpillar mm. to Chris, crystallizing in uh, somewhere around old, old Trafford and Lords, and then coming out. And, and at the moment, it feels like we're mm. blossoming into a beautiful butterfly, doesn't it? Sorry, Dom. Do you want to do you want to have the next pick? Yeah. So, uh, uh, but my next big headline is. Um, and and this is kind of astonishing that this is the third headline because it's Kamindu is the real deal. Um, I don't think there's too much for me to say on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give us the rundown. I mean, he becomes the second joint second fastest player ever to ooh, 1,000 test runs, tied with Sir Donald Bradman. He's got an average of 91, which is the uh, second highest of all time for anyone who scored. A thousand runs. He is the. Um, I think he he is now the fastest Sri Lankan to five Test hundreds by twenty five innings. Um, he just looks a million bucks at the crease, and I don't think we. I mean, I'm not even. I don't even need to say. I don't think we. He, we've never seen a Sri Lankan batter take to Test cricket like Kamindu has. Uh, he looks well organized. He looks compact. He looks like he has plans versus pace and spin. Um, he looks top draw quality. I mean, we've seen Sri Lankan batters who batted and said, okay, yeah, this guy looks like he's going to be a good player, but it's 
all there. He's all put it together. He's in the form of his life and he is cashing in big time. And there just seemed like points in the game, um, you know, when they were batting on, on the on the second day, they just couldn't get him out. There just seemed to be no way for them to get him out. And uh, he looks so at home playing test cricket. Uh, he's been absolutely brilliant. And uh, here's hoping that he's going to continue. Well, probably not at this rate, but um, continue to score runs for Sri Lanka uh, and be a pillar of that batting order for years and years to come. Um I mean, I, I think I've run out of things to say. What's so extraordinary, though, is just how comfortable he looks, right? Because he plays in the back foot, he plays in the front foot. He mm-hmm. he has that one quality that you see in so, so few players, which is that he he appears to play every single ball as if he's never played a... Like, like as if he's a faced a thousand balls in the, in the innings already, and b it's the first ball he's played, which I know is a really clumsy way of saying it's like he can clear his brain of the mm. temporary memory that he's got, so he's not getting caught in traps set up. Like he's so difficult to get out because of this, because he can't get set up, or it's difficult. I I'm sure at some point he he's just he's just not going to finish on an average of ninety one, right? Uh, as much as I wanted to, and I wanted yeah. I, ideally for me, it finished an average of two hundred and fifty, right? Um, and and that's also another reason I thought it was absolutely class that they declared he declared with Red Ink because mm-hmm. it would have been so tempted for him to, you know, got out at one hundred and ninety two or something, or, yeah, right? Yeah, and that kind of ruined his average a little bit. Um, I'm a big, yeah. I, I love looking at averages during the game, so um, yeah. It means a lot to me, but sorry, there will be a, there will be a slight fall off in his average, and at some point he will get kind of quote quotes found out. But oh boy, I mean the stats are all there. I've never seen anyone when I saw you know, you know when Jaswell was was in his like when he was yeah. when he first debuted, which is what so that long ago, about eighteen months yeah. ago. I was just like, I don't see how anyone could kind of do this, and also I don't, I can, I can't imagine that anyone. Uh, ever from Sri Lanka coming and just being so fluent at mm-hmm. test cricket from the get-go. And, and K- Kamindu was there. He debuted before Jaswell. We didn't even know. We didn't know. Mm-hmm. But actually, I think that leads to a wider discussion. I mean, he looks so comfortable now. Would a 22-year-old Kamindu Mendes dropped into the into the test line look this uh-huh. good playing international cricket from playing test cricket from, from the get-go? Or is it an actual genius and master, master plan slash master stroke from SLC to have kind of delayed his arrival into the test team um, for mm. so long? I mean, I don't know what he would have done at 22, but I think I think it's just, it's one of those things where we just have to enjoy this run. Because yeah. he is playing, so, and and how good is he to watch? I mean, he is. Uh, I was telling, I was talking to my my dad, and he he loves watching left handers bat. And I said, if you want to see an elegant left hander bat, just watch him into all the strokes. He loves scoring between you know third man and and extra cover, and uh, you know they're like, how do we stop this guy from scoring? And and because he is so fluent and he is always out there getting ready to, he's always looking to score, which I think is something you want to see out of a batsman. He's got a hunger for runs and, um, you know, he might edge a couple early in his innings. That's his, like the one weakness that I see is when he gets out early, he's edging to slip, but because he scores so quickly and gets into his innings so quickly, oftentimes they've moved the slip right there. And he'll, and he'll edge between, first and third slip or between fourth slip and gully and there's nothing you can do. He's just a run scoring machine. Um, He just looks so comfortable out there and it's, it's just fun to watch and fun to see and um, all kudos to him. And uh, let's see him continue to get better match after match. Yeah. I mean, gosh, that one, eight, two, that like at some point at the end of the year, we're going to do a top, our top five mm. innings, shrunker innings of the year. And, uh, that's going to be right up there, isn't it? <laughs> and, and you know, it's going to be hard to beat. It's yeah. going to be very hard to beat. Yeah. All, all the other... So Mark... Oh, go ahead. 
I was going to say what's so what's your what's your num- what's your fourth big headline from this from this match? We've covered we've we've gone for the big one so far. We've got uh, this is one of the best teams that they've had in a decade. We've got big bold decisions from the the brain trust and Kamindu being a world class player. So what's what's number four for you, Mark? i the I think there's two that are kind of hanging there. That needs to be mentioned. Mm. I'll leave. I'll leave one for you because I think you'd be more enthusiastic than I have. I'm going to say, pushing Kissel Mendes down to number seven has it's been genius. I, I, you know, we're all trying to say that Nick Brooks persuaded them. Nick Brooks of Murley End and of an Islands Eleven, um, the the historian of Strunky Cricket, persuaded us all that this should happen. It happened, and it was glorious. Um, I, I like Kusil Mendes is is he's going to be one of those people. I wouldn't want to write when when he retires from from cricket. I wouldn't want to be the person that has to yeah. write his story. Right? Uh, maybe maybe oh, leave my. that to Nick because I don't think there's a more polarizing player in, in Sri Lanka at, in this team at the moment. Um, mm. Chandy has passed his his crowd. Um, to, to him, um, but playing him at seven just looks like a master, another genius move by the powers that mm. be. He looks like he can play his more, yeah. more natural game. He looks unburdened uh, by it. He's playing against an old ball, which he almost never gets to do in any other form of cricket. Um, and it's, I think psychologically, it must be quite terrifying because. Especially if you look at the way that first then it shrunk his only in his in the, in the second test mm-hmm. went, where oh, they've yeah. got out uh, Pat and Early and they've thought right. If this is from a New Zealand perspective, they've probably thought right, wicket's coming, wicket's coming. Then our boys are just like dug in a lot and kept digging in, and then they suddenly got wickets, slowly got wickets, mm-hmm. and then you're like, right, surely this is the end. Surely we're getting to the tail, and then Kussel mm-hmm. comes out and just starts peppering this ball around all over and actually you know he's not playing as he plays a white ball at all that I'm I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm characterizing it wrong but he's just playing he just looks comfortable he looks relaxed playing there um and also yeah I think there is some value in having him in the team because he's quite funny on the stump mic um especially his his bowling as well um (laughs) So, so the the kind of this series renaissance of Kissel Mendes is, I think, quite something. Yeah, I you know honestly, I I agree here, and um, he's probably the hardest player to analyze fairly in this team um, because the opinions are so vast on him and his career has had so many high points, low points, some his fault, some not his fault. Um, to, to, to sum it up would be um, incredible. And he, you know, he's only 29 years old. That That's the crazy part of it is that um, we've had enough storylines, enough ups and downs to fill a whole career, but he's still relatively, uh, relatively young. And I think the the big thing for me is what you said. He looks totally unburdened at number seven. Um, he looks like he can just go out and play his game, but not just play his game. But I think it's he plays best, in my opinion, when there is a clear role des- designated to him. It's like opening in T20 cricket, right? Go after the bowling, get runs and score, right? And at that seven spot, right, he has, it's been very clear, his role is to uh, accelerate. Right, make sure that they get runs on the board, they score them quickly, um, and to take on the spinners because he is um, whatever whatever we say about him, he is one of our most talented players of spin. Um, he's very capable of bashing it around and playing against the old ball is something that it seems like he he relished. Um, I think as a keeper, he like you cannot play Chundi as a keeper um, anymore because of his his back issues. That's just asking for problems. And I think he's he's a very athletic player, and he he's created some chances for the side with his stumpings, with his um, catches off of deflections. And I think that's been a a, a big plus. It also seems, and uh, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, like in terms of what you were saying about the stump, like 
he's constantly encouraging the bowlers. I think when he didn't play in that second test match against England, there were some times where like you didn't hear any noise being made around the, around the park. And I think that's, that's kind of an important role to play. Um, and we can't really mention Pusal's success without ch- giving a shout out to Chandi. His hundred from number three seems so long ago now um, after what Kamindu did after bowling out New Zealand for 88. His decision to move up to number three, which we've talked about relentlessly on the show, being a very difficult position, making it his own and scoring a hundred. Props to Chandi for stepping up as a senior, taking on that role and making it his own. And now you've had three, five, and seven with guys who can score runs. And that's that's made a huge difference. Um, shout out to him for taking taking on that tough role and making it his own. And um, more challenges are going to come in South Africa. I think this will be a big question. How, how do these guys face the moving ball um, against a, a South African side that has some very good bowlers? But we'll see that we'll learn about that in a, in a month or two. Yeah, I'm excited about that series already. I did have a thought um, mm-hmm. before we get into five areas that we need to improve. Um, sorry, one more. <laughs> sorry, you still got one more. Yeah, you give us your one more, then I'll tell you what my thought was. And also, if you're listening, okay. and you haven't subscribed, then that is very naughty of you. You need to hit that subscribe button, hit that follow yes. button, help us grow the early end, and also tell all your friends about us and leave us comments as well, all the good stuff. Go on, Dom. Yeah. Um, fielding. That's my that's my um, fifth good point. Uh, Prabhath and, and Nishan Puris were both very good and like props to them for taking advantage of the goal pitch and all that. But um, I can't remember the last time we could say that Sri Lanka outfielded New Zealand in a match. Um, taking those close catches, not dropping balls, being after it all the time, and even sort of the old war horses being aggressive and and keeping things tight. I thought that was something that was amazing to see, especially on the back of an England series where you probably have a better sense of this, Mark, because you were on the ground. There were some times where they looked really poor in the field. But this series with the close in catches, um, the energy levels, the, the the deep catches, I thought they were very, very good. Can, I'll just add to that. Actually, when they were in England, their field had kind of impressed me, right? Because um, mm-hmm. you could tell there'd be it was something they were working on. I mean, Milan Ratnik is an incredible fielder, um, and, and a few of them are, are are really good. You know, DDS and and Pat Kamindu as well. Kamindu Kamindu's good. Um, yeah. The, the at Manchester, I got really frustrated because Angelo just cannot field outside the slips. Like he has to be, if he if he's on the field fielding, and if he's got to field, which he's got to, then he's got to feel close up to the batters, right? And they were putting him in places where he was going to have to run, mm-hmm. and he's sadly because of the injuries, he, he just can't can't do it. Um, I think once they put their minds to it, I think yeah that. The, they're really good. Also, the other thing I will say is that points through the England series, it was really cold. I mean, it was cold for English people who lived in England there, who were born here and lived here their whole lives, like me and Nick. So I can't imagine what it must have been like if you're from Sri Lanka. Um, and, but yeah, I think the, the field has been on an upward trajectory. I mean, there was a quote from Salah talking about fielding and how that's the one, like, the one thing that they don't want to, uh, kind of one non negotiable, as it, as it were. And I think, that's mm. absolutely bang on. That's exactly the kind of language we as fans want to hear, right? Because, you know, that is yeah. the one thing you can work on as a unit and you can improve mm-hmm. on it and you can get better. You know, you could have you could bowl the best ball in the world, but the, the person you bowl it to could be having the could be the form of his life. Um and, you know, vice versa. You could just all have a you could get timed out playing cricket, right? And that happens to some of our players occasionally. So, you know, there's there's a lot of uncontrollables in, in cricket. Fielding is controllable, and we're definitely, at this moment in time, in control of it. So it's good to... I think it's quite... It's good that we've got a top of it, and that, you know, that, that's probably the difference between having to bat and not having to bat that that final innings for Shrunk, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. While, while I'll just... Have add one more little little thing um, to our kind of pluses. I think the follow on actually throwing mm. them into bat again um, 
which I always think is a, a tough decision, right? Mainly because, you know, I watched a lot of off England in the 90s when they'd have to follow on. <laughs> and sometimes Australia would would kind of come unstuck a few times, right? Um, mm. But because you've got to manage, you've got to manage the five days. And, and actually, I think DDS has started yeah. to really find his groove in, in doing that. And I thought the follow on was a bold decision, but they did it. And it obviously all worked out. Well, even though, Dom, I did text you and I think, well, the morning of the third day and I was like, oh, it's the third or fourth day. I was like, oh, I could just see Ratchet batting for two days here. <laughs> you had a nightmare, didn't you? That was, that was. Uh... Yeah, I, I had a nightmare that he made 200 and um, then I woke up from my nightmare and it wasn't true. <laughs> um, shall Which we get it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely great. I was very happy it wasn't true. Um, should we get into our five areas that we think SL can improve on going forward as a test playing mm-hmm. team? Um, do you want to give us your first one, Dob? I was going to say you're up, Mark. This is this one's on you. Yeah, um, I think the area that Sri Lanka needs. Yeah, to, there you go. Yeah, I think the area that Sri Lanka needs to improve on um, the the most in in all of this, in all of this, is if if they want to go to South Africa, right, because that's not what we're looking at, is, is basically managing our seamers mm-hmm. um, a little a little bit better and, and working out who our main seamers are, um, who's and when they should bowl, what spells mm-hmm. they can bowl. Are they fit enough to, to go to South Africa and play 10 days of cricket? Um I mean, Larry, we talked about it. He missed out the, the second test. Milan came in. Milan didn't have to do anything, which is cool. Um, we, I think if, if we're going to go to South Africa and win, I don't think we can rely on our spinners taking the bark of the wickets, right? They're not going to get, well, how many did they get? 15 or 16 wickets. Mm-hmm. This time around, they're going to need, or they got more than that. They're going to need to to. The seam is going to need to step into it, and I do wonder if actually you come out of a series like this from Gaul, and you're a lot more comfortable, uh, or or you feel much mm. better than you actually are because you've you've played a wickets that Prabath is the most comfortable on, and can pick up wickets every day of the week, and you've got mm-hmm. you're slightly overconfident going to South Africa. That would be my one area to. I want to say of, of concern, basically. That's my main area of concern. Can we manage getting 20 wickets over two, in over f- five days in South Africa? Well, one answer to that is, well, we did that in, in the UK. So that, that, it, that counts as a plus point. And we did it without any spinners, which was also another plus point. But I will say one thing, um, kind of, this will be my, my thing to work on that's kind of supplementary to what you were saying is that bowling plans. I think when things go well, it's easy, right? You get them all out for 88, everything looks right. Now, what do you do when there's some resistance, right? So we saw New Zealand come back and score 360 runs, which I think is probably more than we would have liked to have seen. Um, There were times where Prabath, they they took the attack to Prabath, and um, we didn't really seem to have a good idea about what to do right? How to handle that. Um, I will say, I think someone like um, Nishan Pires was really good in this match because he he was very consistent with his line and length. And and I felt that he bowled fuller and that made it harder for the New Zealanders to sweep him, um, which I think is like often the plan of attack for um, non-subcontinent batters is, okay, let's just sweep um, but if you push it full, then you bring in Bold, which is how he got Ravindra out and LBW into play there. And I do think that they need to be a little bit more careful about oh, letting the game wander because I think they let the game wander because they had 500 runs to play with. Yeah. Fair enough. But in a tighter match, I think that's where you can really lose. lose. Like I think, again, to go back to that first test match we played, um, we let them get to 255 for four um, because we didn't really have a plan. We had these two seamers that we didn't really use. It was just, okay, let's bowl Prabath and Ramesh continuously. I think DDS is getting better at that. I thought he brought himself on at some key moments. Um, I think on the 
what was it, third or fourth day of play, he was the one who broke the big partnership. Um, so he, using himself is a, is a big way forward. But I think especially if they're going to be aiming for that game in London, they should go into that South Africa series having kind of mapped out the way that they want to dismiss these batters. And I think by the third test in, in England, they had done that. They'd said, okay, these are how we're going to work everybody out. But I want to see them go in, right? Like DDS has months to plan this, go in and say, okay, I've watched these different batters and this is how I want to work them out. This is what kind of field I want to set to them. And so they have good plans from day one. So instead of just saying, okay, well, we bowled well today, things worked out, always have a plan that you're going to stick to um, or an approach that you're going to stick to and know how to change things up. Because I think we still have a tendency to let the game drift a little bit, especially when it comes to our bowling innings. Um, can I just, on, on bowling plans, it's interesting you bring that up because when, whenever I watch Prabhath bowl, I always think, I, my, my theory is, is that he doesn't really set players up for the wicket. He just, he's always looking for that, mm -hmm. that kill no. ball. Um, and that's why he ends up getting hit a lot because he's always mm -hmm. trying to find that right area to pitch it into or the, the right ball that's going to um, somehow somehow get them out, Yeah, which I think is quite curious for a bowler of his experience. I know he hasn't played that many test matches, but he's been playing first-class mm -hmm. cricket for a long time. That That's kind of the way he bowl, wh bowls, yeah. which is why I think he might have come slightly unstuck in in when he came to England. And also yeah. why I think at this point in his career, he's got a long, long way to go, I suspect. Um, why the difference between our two really great test spinners and him at this point, I think there's a bit mm -hmm. of space for him to grow. I think he'll grow into that. Maybe we need to talk about the spin bowling coaches. Yeah. Maybe we don't get into that right now because that might be a conversation for another time. Um, because I think that might be where somebody needs to kind of pull him aside and be like, this is what you need to do. But also it's about his process into mm. it, right? I could be totally wrong though. I might not be right. He might feel yeah. like he's he's got a process into it. But I also feel though when DDS comes on, it's not a kind of final throw of the dice, right? It's not a let's just mm. let's just stick the yeah. doublers down and see what happens. DDS actually kind of sets you up a little bit when he when he gets when he gets yeah. up a wicket. Um, he has a plan. I, I, Mark, just to pick up on that, I agree with you about Prabhath. It seems like he has two or three ways of dismissing batters, right? So it's, it's okay, I'm going to get that, uh, land that, um, the off spinning ball and take the edge, you know, with a good delivery, or I'm going to trap you LBW or bowl you with the one that slides on with the arm, or um, I'm going to try to go over the wicket and try to get it to spin back into you if you're a left hander. And you don't see too many of those ploys like, okay, we're going to bowl outside off stump. We're going to dry him up. Yeah. We're going to see if he's going to play across the line or and dangle one out there for him to do it. And it seemed like um, Nishan Pires had a bit more of a set of plans where he could kind of anticipate what was happening, uh, where he said, okay, this guy's playing a big shot. Um, he's going to come down to the wicket because I've been bowling full, so I'm going to bowl it flatter and get the guy stunned. So I think that's kind of one of those things that Prabhat has to work on is um, it often does work at Gaul when you pitch it in that one good line and length that you're able to get good purchase. But we have proactive batters who've played white ball cricket now. So they can just step out and hit you off your length or sweep you um, off your length. So having that second, third plan and having it set up so that, you know, Oh, you can think about how do we frustrate these batters? How do we build pressure? How do we force them into the shot that we want? Um, I think you're absolutely right in in sort of that's the sort of next level to go from, yeah, he's a good bowler who can take wickets at Gaul to someone who's a really world-class um, spinner. Um, do you want to give us your second area that you think Schlanker could, could kind of work on? Yeah, I think, um, I think, again, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but I think one thing that they that has really improved, and I don't think this is an issue in the last test match, as much as um, the first is partnership building. And I think um, we've, we've kind of realized that there's no Steve Smith or no Virat Kohli or no Kane Williamson, who is oh, just going to... Uh, 
there is Kamindu, but you know, I well, I think one of the things that Kamindu does great is he bats really well with these other players. He knows exactly when to go, when to attack, um, how to bat with different players at different points. So I think that's got to be a big part of it, especially when they go to other parts of the world. Is like, all right, what approaches are we going to take to build partnerships, even if we can't, you know, even if there's a ball with our name on us and we're going to get out for sixty or seventy, how do we make sure that each partnership builds up and builds value. And I think connecting that batting lineup is something we really saw in that last test. There was like, it was seamless, right? Everyone felt comfortable batting with one another. Um, So I'd like to see them continue to do that. Um, And this was, you know, one of the first tests in a while where we didn't see a clump of wickets fall at any time. So that's the, how do you protect against the collapse? And how do you um, think sort of, perspectively about batting. Um, and again, it's a plan issue, right? When you're when um, you're facing South Africa's bowlers, you should come in and say, okay, these are the guys I'm going to look to score off of. This is how I'm going to look to make my runs because it can be very hard and it could look like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to score off of Rabada today. But you have to be proactive. You got to think about how to put those partnerships together. And the infusion of youth, I think, also helps in terms of running between the wickets. So that's kind of the next step is how do you avoid those collapses overseas? And I think that's built through partnership batting and understanding how um, you're going to put your innings together. Do you know what? It's funny because I've got a, a sub point that I think kind of works into what you say, but could also be a standalone point. And that's we've just got to cut out the runouts. I feel like mm-hmm. when you play Sri Lanka... You gotta get that. We're, we're like if you're the if you're the bowling side, you have gotta think. What we gotta get one run out here um, somewhere mm-hmm. along the line. The amount of times, and I don't think other teams do this. I, for other teams, a run out mm-hmm. is a rare occurrence. For Sri Lanka, it is a innings occurrence. It happens almost yeah. every time. Mm-hmm. We saw it happen. <laughs> uh, you know, they can win a test emphatically at goal and still somehow manage to have a run out in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. I think I yeah, think yeah. it's. Um, you know, it goes to what you what you were saying there, right? Run out, of course, runouts do happen occasionally, right? Of course, there's like runouts yeah. should only ever happen if there's an incredible bit of fielding. Uh, where yeah. weirdly, I think runouts have started to happen with Sri Lanka when they're trying to push a two to a three. Um, yeah, which that should never happen, <laughs> right? Um, right? Right, right. But I, I mean, think it's, it's a, a I think bit it's of the same. Obviously. It's the same point, though, right? It's- yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sh- Where, you know, yeah. Should I-, I don't have too much more in terms of things to work on. I, I, I feel like we've covered it. They played well. I think it's, again, continuing. And maybe if I have to add something, consistency, right? Like, I think they've gotten really sort of over this last two months. They played five consecutive test matches. And so the consistency has come from playing together. And I think the trick will be when they get to South Africa in December, how do we recreate the ethos, the energy, the purpose with which they played? And I think that will probably be the toughest thing uh, because we know they're playing a lot of white ball cricket coming up. They've got a West Indies white ball series. They've got a New Zealand white ball series. So how are they going to gear up and get ready for that South Africa series, which now um, sort of, looms large in the the grand scheme of things as far as world test cricket goes um the, the i i had an idea that wanted to run past you do you think sri lanka could okay could field a competitive red ball team while it had its strongest white ball team playing as well none of the bowling changes for 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 the red ball side yes. There would just be three players that would be Patton, Kussel, and Kamindu. Potentially, that would leave the red ball mm-hmm. team to play white ball. I think at this point, you could even make an argument that Kamindu stays with the red ball team. So they would just have to find a new opener with Patton, which is Madushka. And you could bring in Oshada or Sadira to fill in for Kussel. So you think that they should, well, the problem here is where are they going to be getting their 
their time and their practice. It's not so much the personnel as much as it is the um, gameplay, right? So if you have those players playing red ball cricket consistently, yes, right? But where are they going to get the chance to do that, right? They're going to play domestic games at home. And I think uh, unless you can maybe gin up a tour to Zimbabwe as a... uh, as a as a sort of predecessor to the South Africa tour, that would be one good option. Well, well, uh, I, I, I wasn't I, think... I wasn't necessarily kind of suggesting that they do it like now, but I like as in for for the South Africa series. Though I could actually like now that you've said it, why don't yeah. we try and get get to Zimbabwe or somehow like hire yeah. Harare Sports Grand and play Afghanistan or Ireland as a test, like the week or two before yeah. if we can. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking just in general, yeah. at this point in time, Sri Lanka could play red mm. ball cricket and white ball cricket at the same time and be e- not quite, but equally as competitive, yeah. right? Um, and that is some yeah. testament yeah, yeah. to the I think that of true. this squad. And you know what it also means? Now that I've said it, we're probably going to lose 6-0 to the West Indies, 6-0 to New Zealand, and 2-0 to South Africa, and have a total reset because... Look, Mark, you, you, Mark, you said you, you said that they can feel two separate teams. You didn't say that they would be good. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, true. I mean? that's true. And I think, I think that's, that's, that's... Yeah, so I... I no, I agree. I think... Uh, and again, it speaks to the health of the side. Like, we've seen Australia do this. We've seen India do this. We've seen England do this. But it's very rare that you see a team with the resources of Sri Lanka able to do that. And we can kind of clearly imagine sides. And I think um, there's a lot of players knocking on the door as well. I think we talked about this, too, that there are a lot of players who might rightly feel, hey, it's my chance. I want to grab the chance, but they're on the outside looking in. And um, they kind of have to do something fantastic to make it in. So someone like Nguyen Indu Fernando, who we've talked about having all the talent in the world, he must be thinking, what do I have to do to get into this white ball squad? Or, or someone like Oshada Fernando, right, who scores um, tons in, in a South Africa A series. He's thinking, what do I have to do to make this squad? So I think it speaks really to your point about the health of this side, that you're able to actively imagine hey, there could be multiple sides and there's been strength, right? It's not necessarily about having the best 15. It's about, sorry, 11. It's about having the best 15 to 20. So then not only do you have injury replacements, but you have players you can bring in for different circumstances and for different purposes. Uh, Dominic, if if Sri Lanka made it, you you would obviously stay with myself. You could even stay with my sister. You've got aunts and uncles who lived here as well, so you wouldn't need to. But if you didn't have anywhere to stay in London... Do you think Sri Lanka fans should start looking on bookings.com for for hotel rooms they could cancel for free um, for for around the time of that London test next year? Do you think it's something you know, that is actually a feasible thing? I'm gonna put I'm just gonna go out there and say it. I think we can make it. Like I, I think the ball is entirely in our court at the moment. It's not quite because I think Australia yeah. have, have to lose to India, but um, well, that's actually to our benefit. Um, Australia and India are playing. So someone is going to go down, you know, sort of go down in the rankings because of that. Um, and we'll see how that goes. Um, there are some circumstances if India kind of uh, blows Australia out of the water where we get put in a very favorable position and we may not have to win either of those two tests in South Africa. Um, but again, that's we're dependent on certain things happening. But right now, as you said, the ball is in our court. Playing good cricket um, against two very good test playing nations will get us in there with a fighting chance. Um, and and hey, I, I think if India is going to be one of those two teams, if we're thinking we're going to be in the World Test Championship, you better start looking into those tickets early. Um, because we want to fill up that stadium, huh? Oh man! If if we got there, what I'd really I'd, 
I was thinking about this all the way through from the first day at Old Trafford. What I'd really love, what my dream would be, is if they basically had, I don't know if you have this in American sport, I don't think you do, but at a way end, where just in every yeah. grand that Shrunk could play around the world, all our Shrunk fans can sit together, we can share our mutter rolls, like have a little bit of Arak on the side, um, sing our songs and, pl- and you know play the papare together. Um well, one 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 quarter off every stadium that we play at just for us would be abs like absolutely amazing. Maybe, maybe I should try and get in touch. No, I won't. I won't. It's I, I just can't drink it like that. So, so maybe I should try and get in touch with the people organising the game and see if it's possible. But I will not tell you <laughs> like that. Um, oh my! God. But interestingly, though, I will. What I will say is, I do want to execute that idea at some point. I know Sri Lanka are coming back to England in twenty twenty six. If we're still going. Um, then maybe we should try and do that. Have a kind of merrily end corner or stand or whatever. Um, ten seats for us Shrunker fans. Um, that that'd be great. And um, anyway, Dom, should we leave it there for the kind of series review? We're going to do the series Q and A. Um, if you're watching or listening, this the series Q and A will come out about twelve hours after this is this has been released so do watch for it on your feeds if you got this far and you haven't hit the subscribe do you know what i'm not even gonna bother asking i mean it's over an hour in i think or something crazy like that so there's nothing i can say that's gonna let you hit the subscribe button that's cool that's fine um right we're gonna be back soon we're the burly ed thank you for listening see you in all in a bit <laughs>